Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. So the, the title of the message today is Waving a Right. Kind of appropriate for July 4th, I guess. So if you are able, if you are willing, would you please stand as we read the first 18 verses of chapter 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It is written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the threshers thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap a material thing from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do, we, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching, I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Then we, Father, we, I humbly come before you this morning, thanking you for the, the privilege of standing before your people and sharing your word. I pray that my studies would be fruitful, that Holy Spirit, you would intercede and give me clarity of thought and, and help for that which I say to be accurate and true to your word. I also lift before you the leaders of our country. Lord, first and foremost, for salvation. For those who claim to be believers but are not, that you would work in their hearts by your Holy Spirit, that the blinders would be ripped away from their eyes and the, and the plugs in their ears be ripped out, that they would hear the truth of who you are, Jesus, that they would respond, that they would bend the knee. Lord, what our country desperately needs is a revival. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow us in some small way to be a part of that. Lord, for the rest of our leaders at our state and local level, Lord, I thank you for those who, who love you and who govern according to your will, but we pray also for those who do not. Lord, that we would be on our faces before you praying for them, that they might have salvation. Lord, thank you for the country in which we live, the privilege that we have to join together to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to sing your praises, to, to pray in your name without fear of repercussion. I pray for our brothers and sisters in places like China and Saudi Arabia and North Korea and, and other places where just to say your name could land them in prison. Lord, would you be with them, Lord, and would you give them strength, and would you allow them to 
have opportunities to share the gospel with those around them. Again, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you have done for us. It's in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as we look at this passage today, there's going to be a, a little short part before I launch into the main part of the, the passage. And, and this, this part is, um, I'm not exactly 100% sure why Paul chooses to do this at this time, but Paul takes an opportunity to verify that he is an apostle. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Now, it's interesting. Most of us or all of us should realize that the Bible, Paul did not write the Bible in pericopes and chapters and verses. He did not write along and put in little numbers. Um, and so what happens over the years, verse 3, there's been some discussion about whether or not this is my defense to those who would examine me, goes with what precedes that in his writing or with what goes after it. Um, in my estimation, and I know for uh, some of you this will come as a great shock, I am going to disagree with a, a lot of people who would say it goes with what comes after I really believe that what Paul is trying to do is defend against those who are questioning his authority as an apostle on what he teaches. Now, in chapter 8, what were we talking about? Dan, you can't answer because hopefully you remember. Food, food. Is that all we remember is food? Yeah, you're grace, brethren. All right. Anyway, um, we were talking about, or Dan was teaching on food sacrifice to idols. That that Paul said that idols are that idols are nothing. These false gods are nothing. And so I have the freedom uh, to eat this food. I'm, I have this freedom. In the but if my freedom causes a brother to stumble, then I will never eat meat. Okay. Paul had the freedom to do something. But he waived that freedom because of the others around him, because of his love for them, because he knew that he did not want to be the cause of them stumbling. And I think as he taught, Paul's like, let me take a moment here to remind you that I am an apostle. And he gives one of the clearest uh, things that we require of an apostle is that he has seen Jesus Christ. You know, he saw him on the road to Damascus. As I look through the Apostle Paul's life, I wonder, though he was not a follower of Jesus, did he see Jesus at all during his earthly ministry? Did he see him and see what ministry he did? But we see here that this is what makes Paul an apostle, that he saw Jesus Christ and that he was appointed by Jesus Christ as an apostle. And then he was saying to the Corinthians, you know, Surely I'm an apostle to you. You saw me do signs and wonders among you. You saw me have the authority of an apostle. Even if others who have not seen me might not think I'm an apostle, I am to you. And this is my defense. This is my apologia to those who say that I am not an apostle. I don't know exactly why Paul chose to do this at this exact point in time in the book. I don't know why the Holy Spirit moved him to write this, but obviously it was important for the, the people at Corinth to hear this again, that Paul has the authority from Jesus Christ to share teachings. One thing I think that is sometimes lost on me is we need to, need to remember, you know, not only did Paul, was he answering questions, but when this letter came to the church at Corinth, they sat down and somebody read it to them, Okay. Somebody read it to him and then probably went back and did some explaining, explaining of it. But for whatever reason, Paul said, hey, at this point, I want you to know that I am an apostle. You've seen me. You know that I'm an apostle. And any of you who say I am not, here is my defense. So that's your first miniature message. And don't you wish that all that, that was all there was. <laughs> all right. So... The next portion of this passage, I believe, is every pastor's favorite passage to teach on. 
it's tied to a long-standing dispute inside of the body of Christ. Whether or not someone who is in ministry, now let's be clear, we are all ministers. You are all in ministry. Even those who are not, uh, have not been chosen as an elder or a lead pastor or a missionary as things, you are all ministers. So, so don't, you know this is true. So don't say this. I'm not saying that we're not all ministers. We are. But talking about people that are in ministry and have this as their full-time calling. So we have this, this, this thing that goes on that you should be self-supporting for ministry. Or you should be a hybrid support for ministry, for and from ministry. So it's okay for you to have a job and also to get paid from the ministry. Uh, it's called bivocational. Um, although it tends, I don't tend to like the, the word bivocational because for most people in ministry, their, their avocation, their vocation, their love is for ministry. They are typically doing something else because they have to in order to make ends meet. And then the third is that getting their support fully and only from their ministry. Now, over the years, I've heard people make the argument that, well, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. That proves to us that anybody who's in ministry needs to support themselves. And I find this interesting because it, was, it is true. There's no denying that Paul was a tent maker. In Acts 18, verses 2 and 3, it says, And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, um, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And so people cling on to this verse, say, look, hey, you're in ministry. You need to figure out a way to support yourself. And what they seemingly do is ignore just a few verses later that when it says in verse 5, it says, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with he was, he only worked with the word testifying to the Jews and that the Christ was Jesus. Or 2 Corinthians 11, 9 says, when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Philippians 4, 15, and 16, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. And so we actually see in the Apostle Paul's life all of the gamut of what people argue for. Yes, Paul was a tent maker. Paul worked with Aquila and Priscilla with his own hands, making tents to earn a living. But then he also, when people came and he had enough support, he devoted his full attention to the gospel of Jesus Christ, his full attention to sharing the gospel with the Jews and with the Gentiles. When Paul was in a Roman prison, he was not bivocational. He was not a minister and a prisoner, right? He wasn't getting paid to be a prisoner. Uh, churches around the, the, the New World there would send money so that his needs could be met. And I, I, I will confess, I don't understand why this gets to be such a controversy. I've heard people say that no one in ministry should expect to be paid from the ministry. And I hope as we look at this passage that it will become abundantly clear what God's teaching is on this. I think one reason that pastors aren't really keen on teaching on this is because it makes it sound like what I'm saying is, is I need you to give me all your money. And that's not what I'm asking for. This is the next passage that we have in the book of 1 Corinthians. And so I am going to teach it to the best of my ability. Some of you may be offended if you are please come and talk to me. Let's work through this and understand why God's Word says this. One of the first things I, 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 I want to do, I'm trying to think, okay, that's like the third first thing. That's pretty good. Um, is I want to clear up a misnomer. In verse 6, he says, or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Paul is not saying that being in ministry is not working. 
I once heard somebody say to a pastor, well, you need to get a real job. Okay. Uh, those of you who are here on Wednesday night as we uh, um, been watching the video series by uh, Steve Lawson uh, talked about how he studies more now as a pastor than he did when he was in law school. Now, most of us have not been to law school. I, I know of at least one person in this room that's been to law school. There is a lot of studying that goes on in law school. So to think that someone who's in the ministry studies even more than when they were in law school, that's a lot of work. Even Paul talked about how he was being poured out for the ministry, and he talks about the emotional and spiritual drain of his concern for the churches. So when Paul says this here, he is not saying that being in ministry isn't work. He isn't saying that being in ministry isn't worthwhile. And I've heard people say, sometimes they, they think it's jokingly, but it, it, it has hurtfulness to it. It's like, oh, I wish I had a job where I only had to work two hours a week. Well, you know what? I wish I had a job I only had to work two hours a week. Actually, I wish I had a job I didn't have to work and people would just pay me, right? So being in ministry is work. It is effort. And not just the studying. It's just it's, it consumes people in ministry. And so Paul is not saying here that it's not work. What he's trying to say is that why is it only Barnabas and I who have to have a separate job? So what I want to do is give us from this passage five substantiations for supporting those in ministry. Five substantiations. And remember that Paul is dealing not only with Jews, but he's also dealing with Gentiles. And so his, his substantiations kind of run the gamut for things that Jews would easily understand and things that um, Gentiles would easily understand. And perhaps the first one that we're going to go through here uh, is one that most people say, well, that's not really a substantiation. But I, I really do think it is. He, he says first here in verses 4 and 5, he says that it is given to other spiritual leaders. He says here, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? He's trying to say, it's like, look, you are providing support to the other apostles. You are providing financial and physical support to the brothers, half-brothers of Jesus. Why is Cephas out separate? I don't know. Peter's also an apostle. But Paul is saying, look, why is it you're saying that you will support these people, but you won't support Barnabas and I? You guys have already said that you think that being in ministry is worthwhile of being supported, but that you won't do it for us. John MacArthur says on this, he says, I believe that this verse supports the principle of paying pastors, evangelists, missionaries, and other such Christian workers enough so that their wives do not have to work, so they can have more time to be with their husbands in the ministry. No doubt one of the contributing causes of divorce among ministers today is that many of them are not able to spend enough time with their wives and families. Obviously, a wife with small children at home or with other such commitments is limited in the trips she can take. The point is that when it is possible for her to go along, every effort should be made by the sponsoring group to pay her way. It is a question of the right attitude, the attitude of generosity in supporting the Lord's full-time workers. And I, I do understand this as, as we have gone through the years. I think sometimes people look at those in ministry and they're like, oh, look, you have a wife. Your wife can work. And so we, we aren't going to pay you enough to actually live on. We're going to pay you in such a way that we know your wife can go and get a job. Now, now understand my heart here. For sometimes you, you just have to do it. And I understand that. Sometimes uh, churches and ministries don't have the wherewithal to provide you enough money, but you want to be in ministry there. And that's something that has worked out together, but it's, it's something that you're doing under the freedom of your choice, not because someone is looking at you and saying, hey, you have a wife, they can work. Many moons ago, not here, but when I was first out of college and I was desperate for a job, 
I was interviewing at Christian schools to be a teacher. Um, and almost every single one of them said, you know, the pay is not very good, but our expectation is that you will have another job and that your wife will work. And I will confess, it made me not want to take the job. As a matter of fact, I never worked, never worked at a school. Because even when I was a, as a youth pastor, um, and this maybe not as many moons ago, so, and, and churches would approach me, and it's not like thousands of churches approached me, one or two did, um, and said, hey, we'd like you to come and be our youth pastor. And I'm like, well, how much does it pay? And they would tell me how much it pays, and I'd be like, oh, okay, how does that work? And like, oh, well, you'll have to have another job and your wife will have to work, but we'll help her find a job. And what used to always, and this, this is maybe a sin on my part, what always irked me about it is that they would be like, hey, we're not going to pay you very much, but we still want you to work 50 hours a week. We want you and your expectations to do all of these things, but guess what? We're not going to pay you enough to live on. And it was so frustrating to me because I'm like, then do you really want it? Just be honest. We can't afford for you to come. And then make the expectations match. And, and this is not meant to be, and maybe it's just because it's, it's, it's a wound that, though it's old, is still fresh. I can still remember one year, my, what I thought was my youngest daughter, Sarah, uh, turned out she wasn't my youngest daughter, but she was for seven years, was born on July 2nd. And the youth typically went to youth conference middle of July. And so I had told the parents, it's like this year, I, I, I can't leave, I can't leave my wife at home with a two week old baby. And somebody, they don't go here anymore, cornered me in this office and told me that we pay you to be a youth pastor, you need to go. And I'm like, my wife is more, so, no, no, you are our youth pastor, you are to go to conference. Well, guess what? I didn't go. I was very grateful because Pastor Randy and the elders understood I needed to be with my family. Listen, being in full-time ministry doesn't mean you don't have a family. You know, we, we talked this before. Paul said it's better to be single, right? Because you don't have all those things. But we need to understand when someone has a wife and children, just because they're in the ministry doesn't mean that we think, oh, well, you know, you're in ministry. It doesn't matter that you just had a child. It doesn't matter that your wife just had a baby. You still need to go. The second is, and I think this was an argumentation that would make sense to the Corinthians, is, is that it was, it's customary to pay people. Verse 7 says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk. It's very common, you know, even looking back at like, um, I was looking back in like the 1600s, when you would work a farm for somebody, yes, they got produce, but you got some of the stuff too. You got some of the meat, you got some of, of, the, of the harvest. You know, when you were doing all that work, you were getting something out of it. And I think this is something that the Gentiles in Corinth would understand. Hey, I do a job, I expect to get paid. You know, when we have what I, I, Dr. MacArthur calls it the system of man work, which I think is, uh, I, I stole it. Um, so it's interesting. If you don't give attribution, it's stealing. But if you have attribution, it's just stealing by giving attribution. Never mind. Um, but I like that when he says it, but who of us, when we are having a job in the system of man, don't expect to get paid? Uh, Dan, praise God, just got a job at a school. He's not expecting to get paid. Shock to Ellen. No, just kidding. Okay. How many of you have a job and you don't expect to get paid? All right. When we work, I, I, now I'm going to say this because I understand. If you're a small business owner, you may not get paid. <laughs> but it's not because you don't want to get paid. <laughs> it's not because you don't want to get paid. It just kind of works out that way. But if we have a job, we, we expect to get paid. And, and so somebody who's in ministry, we've asked them to devote 40 or 50 hours of their life to do something. And so we should pay them. We should compensate them. It is not that the work is is um, 
I should have wrote this down because it was I had this great thing in my head at my table yesterday and now I've just completely whiffed on it. Um, it is different work, but it's still things that have to be done. There are nuts and bolts things that have to be done. And listen, I am not saying I, I am so grateful because our body of believers is incredibly blessed with a large number of people who work without expectation of compensation. Okay they volunteer their time. And I am so grateful for that. But I think when we call someone to be in ministry, whether it's a, a pastor or a, a school teacher or a youth pastor, a missionary, uh, even a, in a parachurch organization, they have an expectation to be paid and we should not be surprised by that. Third thing is, wait, is that three? I've lost track already. I should have numbered these. Third thing, it's in accordance with God's law. Verses 8 through 11, do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is, for, is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in the hope and the thresher thresh in the hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Now, I, I will confess that at first I had to really kind of think about this because, like, is God calling me an ox? All right. I, I like what Martin Luther, because there's been, there's been some discussion on whether or not this command was written for the ox or if it was written for the Jews. I like Luther, who gave this short thing about it could not have been for the ox because ox can't read. Right? <laughs> How many of you didn't know that? All right. ox, ox can't read. John Calvin says this way, God is not concerned about oxen to the extent that oxen were the only creatures in his mind when he made the law, for he was thinking of men and wanted to make them accustomed to being considered in behavior, so they might not cheat the workmen of his wages. Therefore, what he goes on to add, and this is Paul, he that ploweth ought to plow in hope, etc., is an interpretation of the commandment, as though he said that it is extended in a general way to cover any kind of reward for labor. Now, I will confess that this, this really kind of interests me, so I actually spent some time studying it out. What would happen is there were several scenarios in which you would have an oxen to tread out the grain. One, it would be your own oxen treading out your own grain. And so you would not want to muzzle the ox because back then, ox are important. Oxen are important. And so while they're treading around the grain, they would get to eat some of the food while they're going around to keep up their energy. The other would be your oxen treading out someone else's grain. Well, you're not really con as concerned about their grain as you are your ox, so you let them eat as they go around. But what appears to have been a problem was is when you borrowed an ox to threat to stomp out your own grain. So then you were concerned about your grain and not the ox. And so you would muzzle the ox in order to make sure you got as much grain as possible, because if you sent the ox back a little weak, that was no concern to you. Now, it is kind of interesting. I don't know if this is a straight line, but one commentator said, this is why rental places have in their agreements that you will return equipment in good working order as you received it. And so this command really was written for the guy who, the Jew who was borrowing an oxen to let him know, like, you need to honor your brother by taking care of his ox, which made me think even more that God thinks I'm an ox. He, I'm an ox on loan to you, and you need to take care of me so that you don't send me back emaciated. I don't know if I, how I feel about that. Is it kind of like being a, a sheep? You know, I don't know. Exactly. But Paul's saying this thing is, listen, just as what he wrote in the law of Moses, you need to take care of people that are in ministry. You should not be saying, hey, they're in ministry, let's starve them, quote unquote, financially or physically. Next, it was a pattern established by God. It says, do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? 
Now, most of us are not Orthodox Jews. Most of us have not been in a Jewish nation that had temple activities going on. But as we look back in the Old Testament, how much inheritance did the Levites get? Who knows? Yes, Jeanette, that's right, zero. The Levites got no inheritance. They got no land. They, they, they got nothing. Yet God took care of them. And I, I'm not going to read the whole um, thing. I just made some highlights here. I would encourage you to go ahead and read later today, Numbers 18. Uh, you can read the whole chapter, but especially 8 through 24, but some highlights here. This is him talking to uh, Moses and Aaron about the Levites. He says, Behold, I have given you charge of the contributions made to me, all the consecrated things of the people of Israel. I have given them to you, the Levites, as a portion, and to your sons as a perpetual due. All the best of the oil and all the best of the wine and of the grain, the first fruits of what they give to the Lord, I give to you, the Levites. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. So God wasn't saying to the Levites, hey, I'm not giving you anything, and too bad. When he said to the nation of Israel, you need to give this tithe to the temple, and hey, you Levites, this is what you're going to use for food. You're going to have, it, it wasn't necessarily only just money, but they got all sorts of meat. They got grains. They got all these different things. Read through the Old Testament, all the different types of offerings. God provided and set a pattern that those who work in ministry, quote unquote, are being provided for by those whom they care for. If you look through, the Levites basically took on the iniquity of those of the Israelites. They did this through the offerings for the sacrificial system, but God took care of them. The last is that it was affirmed by Jesus. It says, in the same way, the command uh, to those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. We have here in Luke chapter 10, verse 7, this is when Jesus sent out the 72. And he says, go into every town and place where I'm about to go, and says to them, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. He had told them to take nothing with them but that the people that they were ministering to would provide for them. And then in um, Matthew 10.10, 10, when he sent out the 12, he basically told them the same thing. He says, don't take a bag for your journey. Don't take two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So Jesus is again affirming or reaffirming this idea that those who work in ministry have an expectation to be supported physically or financially. Now, what is so amazing about all of this with Paul is that he goes through all of this to remind the Corinthians, listen, it is right and proper for you to support financially, physically, those who are in ministry. But then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. It's interesting. Paul is laying down an example for those in Corinth, but then immediately says, by the way, I just want you to know, I am not asking for anything. And I'm not writing this so you'll do something. He is just teaching them truth of something that they need to know and something that they need to do carried forward. And Dr. MacArthur has this commentary on it. He says, The Lord commands his people to offer support to those who minister to them, but he does not command those who minister to accept the support. Paul did not. He had a right as much as any and more than most, but for the gospel's sake, for the brethren's sake, for love's sake, he gladly limited his liberty. He willingly 
waived his right. And so it's right and proper for a flock or for ministry to pay those who work for them. But it's also right and proper if that person says, look, I don't need the money to refuse it. Now, there's some things we need to understand. Paul wasn't saying refuse the money and then act like you're a martyr. All right? That isn't what Paul is saying. Paul had all of his needs met. As uh, Steve Austin does, listen to a podcast from him, you know, God provides all our needs, not our greeds. All right? But Paul is not going to have all my needs, so I'm not writing this, but he was setting down a pattern for these people because the church of Corinth was going to have people who were ministering to them that they needed to support. Now, you know, we have these things, and um, my gosh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out wrong. It's not meant to be. It is okay if, uh, I don't know, maybe. Sometimes people in ministry choose to be hybrid supported because they really believe in their heart that's what God wants them to do. And I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't make you think that I think I'm good because I'm not. But one of the reasons I loved being the youth pastor here is God provided me a good job with the state. You guys were very gracious to provide money to help with ministry expenses. And it was great. But I really felt like it, it was great for my family. We got to do ministry. And I still had a pretty good job that provided all the things that I really needed. I wasn't a martyr. I didn't really need any more money. And so it's, it's, it's okay. When I was at, once at an R.C. Sproul con conference, I sat at a table with a group of pastors. They were all, they all did something else. They were all hybrid supporter. One was a rancher. I, I can't remember what they did. But they loved it because they were able to minister to God's people. And the people they would minister to would, would pay for them to go to conferences, would pay for things. But they weren't burdening a small flock with expenses that they couldn't afford. And, and so when I teach this, you know, sometimes I, I think maybe at this exact moment, I'm, I'm uniquely qualified because I've been completely self-supporting in ministry. I've been hybrid supported in ministry. And now you guys support my family in ministry. And so I've kind of seen it all. And, you know, I praise God for the way that he's done things. But we, we need to realize, though, when, when someone comes, because I, I think sometimes we, we think, you know, like, oh, we need to start them at a very low wage because we need to keep the pastor humble. I've heard people say that the pastor should be the lowest paid person in the congregation. Listen, it is not our job to keep the pastor humble. That is not our job. I just come at, but I'm also not talking about health, wealth, prosperity, gospel, where they have golden toilets and four planes. Okay? I believe that's wrong. So we come to the conclusions. It is right and proper to be full time in ministry and supported in that ministry. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. It is also right and proper to be self supported hybrid supported by personal choice in ministry. And be very clear, there is a difference between bivocational by choice, by freedom, rather than bivocational by compulsion, duress, pressure, or coercion. You should be willing to not make any money because it's ministry. You should be willing to work 70 hours a week for not a lot of pay because it's ministry. I think when we offer someone money, if they, if they honestly say, look, you know, I don't really need the money, and, and you know them well enough to know that they would tell you the truth if they needed the money or not, then it's okay for them to turn the money down, right? John MacArthur says this, the Lord's servants deserve to be supported well. 
There should not be a double standard applying to preachers, missionaries, and other Christian ministers, a standard that is considerably lower than that set for those laboring in the system of man. We should pay them as generously as is feasible and leave the stewardship of that money to them, just as we expect the stewardship of our own money to be left to us. This idea that we just, you know, and I love this, the line says, as, as is feasible. God's not saying to bankrupt yourself in order to support someone in ministry. But, you know, because I've seen it. A pastor pulls up in a blue infinity and people are like, man, they must pay him a lot of money. Well, you know what? If you pay them generously and they made a good investment in a blue infinity, terrific. If they have a nice car, maybe someone gave it to them. I, honestly, I think sometimes we see somebody, they're driving a, a Ford Escort and we're like, oh, they're godly. They, they drive a nice car and they're a charlatan. Another thing I see is that I will fight for every penny at my job. I, you need to pay me what I am worth when I'm working in the system of man. And yet we will overly scrutinize every penny of an increase that a pastor says they need to meet their needs. And I think we just need to be careful of that. And, and listen, I praise God that this is in the middle of the year and not, like, not the day before the budget meeting, because that might look a little odd. And I'm not saying this because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not demanding more money, but this is what God's word says. This is a lot of saying the same thing, just in different ways. You are not more spiritual, holy, or godly when you're self-supported or hybrid supported. You are not less spiritual if you do it that way. You are not more spiritual, holy, or godly when you are ministry supported, and you are not less spiritual when you are ministry supported. What flocks and people in ministry need to do is they need to be in wise counsel, they need to be in prayer, and they need to understand, you know, what can we do? And, and sometimes people will go into ministry willingly taking less money because it's what they really believe God wants them to do, and that is perfectly fine. But no flock should ever think, well, we don't want to give our pastor money because he might get a big head, or he might be able to retire before he's 90, right? I, I, I've seen, I've, I've heard people say to pastors, well, if you were actually had a job where you made something, we would pay you more. Take, take this from my heart. Do we really want to underpay the person who shepherds our souls? Is that really what we want to do? I don't think so. But I love what Paul, Paul makes this great, seminal defense of supporting people in ministry and says, by the way, I've given up that right to that. So you, none of you can say the only reason I wrote this is because I want something from you. And he says, I don't even want any provision from you. And I, I love that. It can be hard to talk about money. Sometimes pastors skirt what they think the word says because they're afraid everybody will leave and they will be unpaid. But my goal, as best I can, is to preach what God's word says and leave the rest to him. If you have any issues with what I've said this morning, please make an appointment to talk to me. Um, do not just go home and stew and have roast pastor. I guess on July 4th, it would be grilled pastor. Um, 16 cents cheaper. Anyway, that's, that's a whole different story. Um, have grilled pastor with your, uh, your corn. And if you don't agree, study it out. Be a good Berean. See what God's word says about supporting those who are in ministry. Tell me, Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you because it's not my opinion. I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm trying as best I can to, to teach what your word says. 
Lord, I know we live in a culture where we'll pay athletes billions of dollars and um, shepherds of souls just pennies. And it just really kind of tells where our hearts are, Lord, for what we give to and what, what we think is important. Father, please forgive me for the times that I've done that. Lord, be with your people. Help them to study your word and to understand your word and, and to understand my heart. I thank you for this congregation, for their faithfulness over many, many years. Lord, may they go forth in your power and might. May they be faithful to proclaim your son, Jesus, to a world that is so desperate and desperately in need of it. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. He is risen. You are free to 